Okay. Uh, test. Is that uh, is my audio okay? All right, great. Um, let's go ahead and get started here. Uh, let's see here. Am I still sharing my screen? Yeah, I think so. Let me know if you can't see that. So I just got the uh, our class side up here at the moment. Um, all right. Um, I uh, got back the um, uh, the program assignments and the test one. Went back, uh, I gave feedback to people. Um, so I, I did some quick feedback on both of those. Um, let me, I'm, I'm not gonna spend very much time on these unless some people wanna ask some questions. Let me just mention a couple of things. Um, so I, for all these tests, um, I will always kind of give a fuller sort of um, um, example solutions or discussions of things uh, after I evaluate those. So you can look at those yourself. Um, um there, there's a breakdown for where the grades were on this class. Um, and uh, yeah, on this first test, uh, mo mostly this is about the written questions. Uh, this first test, there's actually three versions. Of, you had two different written questions, but there's three versions of each. So you should find the one that you were given plus two others. Um, I encourage you, I mean, you know, even though time is a bit short um, on a five-week course like this, I do encourage you to go back, especially if you were uncertain about any of the questions um, and review, um, and let me know if you have questions uh, about, you know, any of the solutions or things, think there might be an issue or something. So the other thing is that um, I do actually sometimes give individual feedback for these questions. So I'm surprised, I'm often surprised by how few students seem to know how to use D2L well. So you should be able to go into D2L um, and look under your quizzes and get into, you know, if you want to go back and look at every multiple choice true false question and the expected answer. Um, and again, I encourage you to do that, especially if you miss some, uh, if you have a question, I mean, sometimes there are some some of those that are mismarked in my, in, in uh, D2L, I have the wrong answer on the question, you know, so uh, if you miss some of those, you might want to check those. Uh, plus, also, uh, if I did give individual feedback, like on the written questions, uh, you'll find that under your test. So you should, should go back and uh, I, I definitely encourage, I mean, it'll help you going forward. Uh, the, the more solid you are on the stuff that we've done on the first two chapters, the better, the faster you'll be able to go on the rest. So, you know, so don't skip over doing a bit of review. Um, uh, to just kind of general things. So for these written questions, I did have one or two people uh, only gave me like the answers, like the, the first question especially was kind of a calculation. So you really need to show your work on calculation. So that person unfortunately missed uh, the question and didn't get any points, right? So, you know, if you show me your work um, and you just had like a typo or a, a, a calculation mistake, you might get all, but maybe just a point off for, you know, um, um, having an arithmetic mistake, right? If you don't show your work, you'll get zero points if the answer is wrong and you won't get the full points even if the answer is right. So you do need to show your work in general. Um, and I guess the other thing is that, um, you know, if the question is more of a written one, I do expect, you know, it, it to be well written. So you need to give me good English. You need to give me full sentences with, with punctuation, capitalization, all, all that kind of stuff. Give me a well-written argument, you know. So don't give me just a sentence uh, if it's a written question. It needs to be like, you know, paragraph or so. So uh, anyway, I, I think that's all I wanted to say on that unless somebody um, had a specific um, um, concern or a question about uh, any of the test one material, so. Um, I don't know if, if, you know, I don't think it's anybody that's here uh, right now uh, live with me, but um, uh, I've actually got two sections of this course in summer. I had I had the settings incorrect on test one, um, so uh, that should be corrected now. Um, so they don't have the actual answers yet. Um, so, uh, but, but yeah, you should try and complete that today or tomorrow. Um, uh, the other thing is I did get back finally, um, I had uh, incorrect, I had kind of posted um, that we had finished off the final value, valuations for the first program assignment a little bit early, but I do have everybody's now returned back with some feedback. So, you know, you should go back to your GitHub account um, and look at the, the feedback I gave on there. There is an example solution. Um, um, 
that you can look at. I, I want to spend maybe just a little bit of time on this. Uh, there's one or two things I want to talk about, about the program assignments. This should help for the, the program assignment that you're working on now for this, this week for the second unit. Um, so anyway, so um, I've actually got the, uh, the example solution in here now. Um, you know, so just so you know, uh, if you get the full solution working, you know, if you do a build uh, and if you run all your tests, like from the testing framework, uh, what you should expect to see is that, um, you know, if you've got all the tests um, enabled um, and running, you should see them all passing with green check marks. All right. So, um, I want to, uh, let's see, I should have made a checklist on these things. Uh, a couple of things here. Um, so there were some people that had some style issues. Okay. So you really do need to use the development environments that were, were set up for you um, um, uh, for this uh, class. So for example, one of the things that's set up for you, if you're using in the dev containers, is that we run a class style checker formatter, a code style uh, formatter and checker. So, you know, if, if you have your code uh, doesn't conform, there's some things that will automatically do for you, right? So uh, every time you say that should be running the, the, the style checker and formatter for you, right? So notice it put that, that line uh, um, on the next line, not after the open curly brace, um, it added space. So all binary operators are supposed to have space around them, but there should be no space before semicolon and other stuff like that, right? So the the you know if you're interested, um, um, that is defined in um, we use the the VS Code. You can plug in different style checker formatters. We use the the standard CLang uh, formatter, right? So uh, this is all the definitions for the formatting that's expected for your code, right? But, but you need to be running, you know, your code through the style checker format. So this is one way I can tell when people aren't actually using the development environment. And going forward, especially if, if I gave you feedback about your code wasn't indented correctly um, and wasn't being run through the formatter, um, I won't grade your code until you actually get it run through the form, the the style, the the, the code styling formatter and checker, right? So it should do some, it doesn't do everything, but it should do things like make certain that your indentation is correct, make certain that the white space around operators is correct, make certain that the uh, placement of opening and closing curly braces is the way that we want it for the uh, the, the class style, right? And, and things like that, all right? Uh, so e an easy way to check, uh, if, if, if if I gave you that comment, you don't know what I'm talking about. If you put like a curly brace at the end of a line and hit save, um, it should reformat the code for you, for example. So all curly braces are supposed to be on the line of their own, indented correctly for the uh, code block that they are starting. So. Um, right. So th this, this isn't just style i mean this actually there's a there's a reason why most uh software projects you know enforce a style and, ha and actually use code style checker and formatters like this um, so for one thing if everybody's using the same style format or checker this helps with git right because we the only things that we want to show up on git differences are actual changes to the code. So we don't want to see, you know, one person is formatting their code with a different style, you know, with, with opening braces in a different place. And in that case, you know, the, the code is actually the same. It's just that the style is different. And, and all those lines would show up as differences uh, when you do a, a diff on, on GitDiff, right? So, so by enforcing a style, if you're working with other people, um, that helps so that, you know, so these diffs can be really useful tools. That, that helps to be able to, only have differences in your commits of the actual lines of code that were changed, modified, or removed, um, rather than incidental changes, you know, like changes in white space uh, or placement or other style issues. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's there's more than just looking pretty for like a style formatter. You know, it has, it has a useful purpose for Git, right? And you should learn how to use that um, correctly. 
Um, another style thing. So in this assignment, you didn't have to write any function documentation. Uh, these were given for you. So when I say function documentation, if you don't know what I mean, I mean, it's basically just, just a, um, um, a block comment, right? Uh, so like before the first function for task one, um, there was this comment here, but there's a particular format we're, we're using. This is an example of a function documentation um, or a project documentation known as doc oxygen. So these at tags, uh, so basically doc oxygen can parse um, this sort of function documentation and this other code documentation and create uh, written documentation or reference documentation from uh, these things. So the, anything with an at in one of these code blocks um, is a doc oxygen uh, tag that it can use to pull out um, your uh, code documentation, right? Um, so, you know, you have to have your function documentation formatted, you know, it's a requirement. Um, and like starting with assignment two, you actually have to write this, right? So um, uh, when you write, when you add a function, um, one of the first things you should do before you actually implement the function is put in your function documentation. So the function documentation should have a brief title with the brief keyword, you should have one or more sentences of a description with like a, a blank space before and after. Every parameter, the name of the parameter has to be the same as given in the, 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 the declaration in the code. Uh, has to be the same in the uh, function documentation. Um, you have to have the at param keyword and every parameter that's input to the function has a separate uh, param documentation for the parameter, right? So you should have the at param keyword, the name of the parameter, and then one or more sentences of description. Um, and likewise, then you should document return values um, and you, you really should document exceptions of so the function possibly throws an exception, you can document those with add exception tags. Um, if the function returns a value like this, you should use an at returns um, to document. So that's all I'd, I'll say about that, you know, but, but yeah, starting with the second one, you, you have to write some of this on your own. At a minimum, you need to have these elements, a title, description, all parameters are documented. If you're curious about that, um, um, Maybe I can quickly kind of show this to you. So the our documentation is actually working um, on these projects. So if you do like a make help, uh, you'll see that one of the targets you do is you can make your reference docs uh, for the system. So if you do that, you'll see that um, it creates a um, subdirectory. Um, if it worked here. called uh, doc uh, and also HTML, um, but yeah, in doc, uh, oh no, sorry, uh, in HTML, um, you'll find all the reference documentation uh, included, I think you can open it up in VS Code. So if you just open up the index, um, uh, oh yeah, I guess you can. So here I'll have to open it up in a file browser, just a second. So, so um, I'll have to open this up um, on my system here. So if I just go to my assignment, um, I should, after you do the make reference documents, you have this HTML file um, directory, which has all the documentation that was generated, um, including um, the index was like the starting, uh, but this is the starting point. But you'll see things like, for example, if I go look at my list of classes, um, I'll see all the classes that were compiled into this project, including the hypothetical machine simulator. Uh, you'll see all the functions defined in there. Um, in fact, I can go there. So for example, you know, if you go back and compare this to um, the initialized, to, to the documentation above initialized memory here, this, th this is where it's pulling it from, all right? So um, if we look at here, so we've got the, the title and then the description and the parameters and everything else, all right? So. Uh, anyway, so that's what that's all about if you were wondering. I do require, it's, again, this is not really the purpose of this class. This is more kind of like a software engineering class or when you take um, our, um, our our capstone classes where you have to do a project yourself. But but yeah, this is good, kind of pretty standard. Uh, most projects have significant code are going to put in reference documentation in the code and be able to generate that directly from the code. So. Um, 
Um, and I guess one final thing before I move on from this, uh, it is important to have two stars here. So that's how Doc Oxygen knows that this is a, uh, a Doc Oxygen comment that is going to parse and pull out to generate this reference document for So you can do things like uh, have the two stars in order to get documentation for functions. Um, and um, you'll see similar, like in the header files, you'll see that uh, another one is uh, three slashes is also an indication for doc oxygen. So these three slashes indicate that these are doc oxygen, doc oxygen documentation for the member variables um, and so on. All right. So just a little thing to keep in mind, but I will expect you to generate those. Um, and I might, you know, either ask you to do that before I grade your assignment if your um, function documentation is missing. Um, 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 all right. And feel free. I've, I've only got a few people here uh, today, which is fine. You know, I, I will, as usual, I'll also record this and, and upload it. But uh, feel free to jump in with questions if you guys have them about things uh, that are here online. So as usual, you know, if you have a question, probably other people have it as well. So um, let me see here. One other thing, you know, so there another thing that people might not be aware of, but we do have debugging capabilities set up on these projects as well. If you are using the development environment, which you know you really need to be using the development environments because we've got all the tools set up for you uh, the way they need to be to do the assignments for the class. Um, so let me just kind of maybe really quickly show you. So the in VS Code over here, uh, this tag is for run and debug. Uh, we've got it set up so you can either run the, the unit test, so you can debug a test session, or you can debug a, a sim, the, the full simulation. Uh, let me let me do the uh, debugging a test section real quickly first, OK? Um, so if I select this and I run in the debugger, uh, this will only work if your code is currently compiling correctly, right? So I, I already compiled my code, and I've got a executable uh, my test executable. Uh, so when I run the debugger, it stops. Uh, by default, it stops in the first line of the main function. So we're using a testing framework called uh, catch2, right? And it has its own main function. So one thing that confuses people from using the debugger uh, for the, the test here is that, you know, it's a little bit tough to step into where you need to, right? So what I normally do is... Um, um, I set a breakpoint, right? So let's let's go ahead and let's say I need to, de to debug my very first task, something to initialize memory. So there's various ways to set breakpoints. Uh, you know, this is a visual debugger, um, but uh, one way, is, the easiest way probably is is um, if you click over in the left hand gutter here, uh, we can set a breakpoint. So if I set a breakpoint in my um, assignment one tests here. And if I continue on, it'll continue running from where it stopped until it gets to this point, right? So we should, um, uh, up here, you've got kind of your continue, step over, step in. And over here, you've got, uh, you can see what the current values of the variables are. I'll come back to these watch points, uh, where you are in the function call stack and your breakpoints and things. So, um, so continue on, it, it continued, and then it hit this breakpoint, we stopped here, right? So from here, if I need to debug this function, or I could have set a breakpoint in the initialized memory, I could just step into here, right? So I'll just go ahead and step into this function, not step over. So if you, if you don't want to step into a function, you want to step over, but uh, I want to actually go in here, right? So let's go into the initialized memory. So you, you'll notice that we're now in the initialized memory, right? So uh, here you can get example of the function call stack, right? So we called, when we started our code, we called the main function, which was in the catch2 framework, which called a bunch of things. Uh, in fact, you can click on these. So I can go back up and down my call stack. So if I click on here, um, the one before I called initialized memory was in the assignment one test, right? So this is one thing that can confuse people because, because of these macros and things are being used. It's a little bit tough to uh, understand the out, you know, like like for these things on the uh, call stack here. But basically, on my call stack, this represents this uh, test case macro uh, that I had the breakpoint on, right? 
Um, and I can click on here to go where I'm currently at. This is at the top of my call stack. So from here, we call it initialized memory. Uh, and now we're actually stepping through initialized memory here, right? So notice, you know, so here I go back to the variables. We can see what the settings are for the parameters that we passed in, right? So we passed in 300 for the base address and 999 for the bounds address, right? So, so you can see those in, in this context on my call stack. I've got a parameter named memory base address, which has value 300 and bounds address, which has 999 here, right? Um, and I mean, also, you know, there's an implicit um, variable called this. If you know how uh, objects work in C++, right? You can even see that in your local variables. So this is this is my pointer to this instance of my hypothetical machine. So it has all of our um, it has all of our member variables. Um, let me just bring up my header file here real quickly. So every instance of our hypothetical machine has the member variables, you know, these, which you should be a little bit familiar with after I've done, after doing the assignment, the our array for the, the holds the memory, the memory base address, bounds address, and all these, right? Um, so if we go back to the debugger here, you can see these in this, right? But, you know, we haven't initialized these yet. So the memory base address, is currently set to zero, the bounds address is set to zero, memory size is set to zero, and so on, because those got initialized in the constructor, right? And these are um, these are separate from the parameters that have the same name within this scope of this function, you know, right? So anyway, you know, we could step over um, and uh, see things as they happen, you know, so this, if you're having problems getting the exceptions to be thrown when as correctly when needed, could have used this to step in there and check your code here. So we're about to set the, the base address in um, our instance here. So as soon as I step over that, we should see that the memory base address in this uh, instance of the class gets set, set to 300 uh, and the bounds address gets set and so on, right? Anyway, you know, again, this is another thing that in general, I hope that people have some familiarity with using a symbolic debugger before you get into a 400 level course uh, in college. But you know, if not, this is a good time to practice um, and it is set up for you to use this, right? So if you are having problems, you know, so if, if you're failing a particular test, you can maybe, you know, debug um, your uh, a test session by stepping into the function and stepping through it line by line and seeing exactly if, if the values of, um, of of everything is as you expect at each step, right? So I can often, you know, for me anyway, 80% of the time, if I have a bug that I don't understand the function, if I just step through it line by line, um, I'll often uh, be able to figure out, you know, as soon as I see something I wasn't expecting, what the issue might be, so. Um, all right, uh, I'll go ahead and, and I just continued just to, to stop the debug session. I, I probably shouldn't have. Um, uh, another common mistake is if you're in a debug session, now we'll just start a debug session again. Um, it's, it's not a good idea if you're currently running a debug session to actually try and build and compile your code, right? So it's a little bit, you know, a good idea to try to be aware whether I'm currently running in a debug session or not. And if I am running a debug session before I go off and start making some code changes and compiling again, you really should stop or, you know, finish off the debug session, right? So you can either continue so it finishes it off if you don't have any breakpoints or just stop it um, to, to stop your running debug session. So. Um, all right, and then one final thing, and I'm gonna leave a little bit of time to see if there are any questions then about this week's stuff. I wanna uh, 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 at least look at the uh, second problem set, but um, um, starting with the next assignment, uh, you probably have to, uh, I should go back and look here, uh, but uh, you, you probably have to, so for this first assignment, you didn't have to do anything to get the full simulation running uh, to get all the system tests running, 
right? But um, let, let me show you in, in case you didn't real, really realize what we were doing here. So, I mean, the whole purpose of these assignments is, uh, let me do a, a clean build here again, um, is we're actually building um, two executables. So the test executable um, has the unit test, which is what you're going to spend most of your time on when you're doing the assignments to get all the unit tests to pass, right? But what we're really doing is we're building um, a simulation. So there's another executable that's created called sim, um, which is the last thing that should be linked together, right? Um, and for all of our assignments, we're gonna be simulating some aspect of an operating system. So for this unit two this week, um, you're gonna be simulating um, uh, actually the, the, the um, um, uh, the, the, the event cycle for a process. So we're going to be doing a simulation of managing a process in an operating system, right? So you can actually run these by hand, right? Assuming that everything's building correctly for you and you've got your sim executable, executable created for you, right? So for, for assignment one, um, we were building a simulation of the hypothetical machine, which you should be familiar with, right? So um, if I wanted to run this by hand, I, I can open up a terminal in my dev container. So I'm open up a terminal in uh, VS Code inside of my development container that I'm running here. Um, uh, if you do a directory listing, you'll see, again, if everything built correctly, that I've got my two executables in my current directory from where I open up my terminal. So the, the unit test executable and the sim executable, right? Um, and I can run the sim executable. I, you have to do dot slash so to run something in the current directory on Linux, you have to do, put dot slash in front of it and then just give the name of the command or the executable that you run. So that will actually run the simulation that we built here, our hypothetical machine simulation, right? Um, all of the simulations that we built build um, in this class are command line simulations. So they're meant to be run from the command line like I'm doing here, right? So um, if you want to see more about um, how these work, these start in, the, there's another file in the source subdirectory. There'll, there'll always be two files. So assignment, whatever tests that have all the unit tests. Again, that's where you spend most of your time, but there'll be, there'll be an assignment, whatever sim, right? If you look in there, um, there's a main function in there. So this is the start, the, the place where the simulations start, right? Um, and if you've never done any command line argument parsing, um, just to show you what's happening here is basically, since we're doing command line tools or command line executables, uh, we expect, for example, in this simulation that we should have three command line arguments. So argc is the number of arguments on the command line um, and argv are the actual command line arguments, right? Um, um, and if you don't get those, we just display a message, right? So this is that usage message. And that was what we got in the terminal when I just ran the, um, uh, the command here. All right. So when I ran this command, uh, since I didn't provide the expected command line arguments, it gave me the usage message, right? So the reason why we expect three command line arguments is the, the, the name of the program is considered the first command line argument. Uh, or actually argv0. So, so uh, argv is really just a, the old style uh, uh, character, an array of characters. That's how C used to um, represent strings, right? And we still use these for command line arguments, right? So argv0 is actually the name of the program, but argv1, since we expect three command line arguments, argv1 is expected to be max cycles for the simulation and rv2 is expected to be an input file right so if i want to run the simulation by hand i have to say i want to run for a, a maximum of 100 uh, fetch execute cycles that's what the max cycles is on the simulation and then i have to give it an input file um so for example all the input files will be in a subdirectory called sim files with a dot sim as the extension on the end. So like if you look at program one that sim, this is the same uh, program that was in our textbook for the example for the hypothetical machine, right? So this is how we define the simulation 
um, for this first assignment, right? So there's a couple of things to start with. So the initial value of our register. So the program counter had 300 to start with, the accumulator had zero to start with. Um, and we defined memory to go from a base address of 300 to a bounds address of 999, right? And this was the contents of memory, right? Now, again, it should be exactly the same as what was in our textbook for the example given on, on how the fetch execute cycle worked. Right? So I can actually run this by um, saying I want to run program uh, one um, in the sim file subdirectory, right? So that will load this um, uh, program here uh, and actually run it for us, right? Um, and what you see, and, and you know, I'll leave it, uh, you know, so I, I, I don't have time, but um, you know, you should kind of look through these and understand how these are working, right? So we get the output. Since this is a command line um, uh, tool here, um, uh, it gets input from the command line, it gets input from standard input, which is from the terminal, and it sends the output to the terminal as well. So the output goes to the terminal, a standard output here, right? So we, we see the result in of the registers and memory after every fetch execute cycle when we run our hypothetical machine. So, um, so just to wrap this up, because like I said, I want to talk a little bit about this week's, uh, about the problem set, but um, that means that once you get near the end of the assignment, you know, you, you probably want to check whether your full simulation is working. So if you have all the unit tests working, uh, your full simulation um, should be close to being working. Um, so for assignment two, I believe there's a couple things that you uh, additional things you have to do before you can get the full simulation working. Right. Um, and then you can run like like I just did here. You can run this by hand on any of the uh, tests that we have. Um, so we had a bunch of tests here. Um, oh, by the way, if you're curious, um, I believe that it, I, I didn't check whether the, these are supposed to be the four problem set questions that you did by hand, right? So if you wanted to um, um, check um, uh, what the result of running problem set question four uh, was, you could have run that, um, assuming I've got the, um, the, the thing the same as the one that I gave you um, for summer here, so. Uh, yeah, it doesn't look right, so it might not be quite right, but uh, to check that. But, um, so yeah, you can run these by hand, but um, basically all of these simulations in here are, are basically what's being run by the, being tested by the full, what I'm calling system tests for these assignments. So, you know, again, most of the time you'll spend running and, and getting the unit test to work, but near the end to test the full simulations, um, uh, you do have to do this from the command line. Um, so there's, uh, I don't, by default, I mean, you could add a keyboard shortcut uh, if you felt you wanted to, right? But I don't, I didn't define a keyboard shortcut for running the full system tests uh, because you usually don't do those very much compared to how much you do the unit test, right? So um, so you can run all the system tests by open up a terminal, do it to make system tests, Right. And what you want to do, if, if you want to get 100% fully on the assignments, is you need to get not only your unit tests to be passing, um, all passing, all defined and running and all passing, but you need to get the system tests also. Um, and just a final thing then, kind of as a hint, so, um, some people got everything working on this first assignment except... Uh, and had the system test running, but um, weren't passing uh, um, the system test three and four or, or two and three. Um, and this was because basically, uh, let me show you how the system test works. It's really pretty simple for these assignments. Um, the system test performs a diff between your output and uh, the expected output, okay? So for example, if I run program three uh, for a maximum of 100 cycles, um, you know, this is the output here. And for program three and four, they were both supposed to uh, hit some sort of an error. So in particular, like for program three, let's just show what it is here. Um, so for program three, um,
yeah, at, at some point we tried to um, jump to virtual address 200 or tried to do a load from uh, memory address 200, but we define memory only to go from 100 to 199, right? So if you hit the right exception that you were supposed to um, by implementing the unit test in your code, you should have got, you should have, an exception should have ended up being thrown in translated address, um, trying to like read or write from memory address 200, right? So um, the, the, the way that the system tests are working is it's just comparing a diff. So this was the output from running my version of the code here, right? So, so the output here was, uh, I just ran from the code. The expected output is going to be in a file called program3.result, right? So, you know, you can see what the expected output from the um, running the system test is supposed to exactly match this output here. Um, if you want to, you know, I mean, I could look through my output. If I was failing a system test, I could look through my output and compare it kind of visually or by hand, the expected output. But you can use the, the system to uh, help you perform a diff, right? So, for example, if I want to, I can use IO redirection. So I can run my command. Instead of sending it to my standard output, I'll redirect it into a file called program three out, right? And then basically, oh, um, um, notice that the uh, the error messages didn't get put to this output file. So you actually also need to, it's a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, running things on the command line in Linux, uh, but this tells it to redirect the standard error also to standard output so that both sta the, my standard error and my standard output end up getting into this file here. Uh, oops, um, except um, it's a little bit picky. So I think you have to, um, you have to put the um, that little syntax to say put the standard error into the right place at the end, I guess it is. There we go. So um, that ended up putting both the standard output and the standard error into that file. Uh, program three got out. Uh, so I, you know, I, I just output or cat catted out all the output that I had in my program three dot out um, just to make certain that I really had everything, including the um, that error message from uh, the exception being thrown there. Right. Um, so once again, yeah, I mean that's kind of what you need to do if you want to capture it. And then you know the reason why you might want to do that is because it makes it easier then. So I can just. Uh, do use the diff tool, uh, which gives a diff similar to like the diffs that are uh, that you see in VS Code for the differences on your source control. So if I want to find out the diff between my program um, and the expected output, I can do a, a diff between my dot out file and the um, and the result file in the sim files subdirectory. Right. Um, and if there's no, and, and this is basically all the system tests are checking for. If there's no difference, then the system test pass passes. All right. Um, but for example, if um, your error message isn't was was expected, so um, if I go to translate address, and if I give a um, different error message. Something like that. So we'll give um, a different error message, one that wasn't being expected. Um, and I'll just do it by hand. I'll just do it make all to rebuild everything. Oops. Um, oh, right. Um, this thing is uh, actually O stream. So I need to actually stream it into that thing. There we go. Uh, make sure the unit tests are still all passes. The unit tests are all passing. I've run the system tests. Uh, we'll see that we're, we're failing three and four because three and four were expecting um, 
um, output uh, errors uh, when it, in the normal running of the um, simulation, right? So if I re, um, oh, by the way, you know, if you haven't used command lines a lot, uh, it's often the case that you can use up arrow to go back in history, down arrow to go forward. So if I go back and rerun um, the simulation by hand to capture the output and, and redo my diff, we'll see that that they're not the same anymore, right? So my output file comes first here. So that was the error message that I currently have. This is what it's expecting there, right? So anyway, the the, the um, uh, summary on that is uh, for, the, for the three or four people that got this far in particular, but weren't passing three and four, uh, that's the only reason is, is, you know, we're being picky, but we're expecting exactly a line for line um, uh, exact match between your output and the expected output, including error messages, right? So you have to get the error message formatted um, the way it's expecting to, to get um, these two tests where an exception is gonna be thrown in them to pass there. So. All right. Um, yeah, I have to probably make a summary about some of that stuff. Uh, I, I, this is described at the end of the assignment one and probably on the assignment two as well, you know, how to run a full simulation, things like that. But um, but anyway, I'm, I'm wanting people to be aware of that, make certain that, that, that you know really what we're doing, right, for these assignments. You know, the, so the point really isn't just doing these tests, it's, it's to actually run, to create a simulation of some aspect of an operating system uh, and be able to run the simulations to do things, you know. So. Um, all right, so I think that was all I kind of had, um, you know, so hopefully all that, ho hopefully at this point, you know, everybody should have their development environment set up, um, and I'm expecting, um, you know, so I might not, I probably won't give any extra time for the second assignment, so make certain that you do get everything done by uh, the due date Thursday, uh, if at all possible. You know, again, like I did for this one, I'll probably try sometime Thursday during the day to give like a preliminary code review. If people have questions on the next program assignment. So. Uh, all right. So let me know if, if anybody had any questions or want me to go back to something, slow down or thing. So. Uh, let's see, it's already eleven forty-four, so I don't have too much more. Um, uh, but but yeah, so I did want to uh, maybe talk a little bit about um our next unit here before I wrap up. Um. So yeah, so now uh, you know for this week we're doing chapter three and four of our textbook. Uh, this is this is about. Processes and threads um, is our topic, right? So, yeah, I, I believe I've got some lecture videos and some things here. Um, oh, uh, yeah, I should maybe uh, maybe Wednesday I'll talk a little bit about the standard template library and talk more about getting started on assignment two. Um, I don't really want to get into that right now, but um, um, so uh, yeah, the other thing I I, I think that I'll uh, let's look at the problem set, uh, see if anybody that's here or if I have any uh, anything I can clarify on that. So um, for this problem set, uh, I, I didn't get anything. So you can just submit a, um, uh, a file. It can be electronic or it can be handwritten if you want to uh, do your work handwritten and scan it in. Although, as usual, you know, for handwritten work, make certain it's legible, um, uh, uh, neat. So I you know, don't make me don't make me have to work to, to understand it or else I might not do the put in the work and you might not get as good an evaluation as you might have otherwise gotten. So um, so uh, there, there's two questions. Um, the second one is pretty important. Um, uh, we're going to be kind of coming back to this question for this unit and the next unit. Uh, it's a question about plastic threads, uh, but um, um, the, the first one here, in case it's not clear, this refers to uh, the, one of the big things you should really understand in chapter three is this the idea of process states and this, this process state transition diagram, the, the three and five state uh, and seven state process state transition diagram that our textbook uh, talks about here. So um, let, me, let me just open that up here real quick. So 
So uh, the the first question is specifically about 3.9 here. So you know, uh, I mean, you can watch the lecture videos. I don't don't have time to go into this, but you know, you should understand uh, the the progression that our textbook talks about. So you know, so the simplest idea for process states is to define two states. You know, the, the, the to differentiate between the running process and all the other processes that are currently in the system waiting. So they're not running. Right? From that, we can we can go we can make a slight uh, variation to a three or a five state process diagram. So the the basic reason why you want to split the not running into two is because when you run the dispatcher, usually you can only select among the processes that are ready to run, right? And and processes that are not running might not be ready to run immediately. They might be blocked waiting on some 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 uh, in I O. Um, or, or block for some other reason, right? So, you know, an, an obvious thing to do uh, for process states is to break up the not running into two uh, and only keep the ready process, the ones that are immediately ready to run if the dispatcher selects it to run uh, in the ready state, right? And then also, you know, the, the, the book skips to uh, five um, states, adds in, you know, explicit states for the, a, a new process that's being created, um, and to put a process into a done or exit state when it's ready to exit the system. Uh, but uh, yeah, the question one is about um, this one here, the um, uh, 3.9b. Um, so here we have the same five states, but we added two more in order to handle swapping, uh, you know, swapping a process in and out, right? So make certain that you understand the difference between swapping a process and a process being blocked and unblocked. Those are very different, but I, I find sometimes that, that people confuse these a little bit, right? So swapping a process out um, is something that most operating systems do in order to, it's a performance kind of thing. Um, if memory is too full, we might select a process. And so anytime a new process is created, we have to allocate some memory to hold the code and the data for the process while it's running, right? But memory is a precious resource. If memory becomes too full, we might want to free up some memory, right? So one way that we can do that is we can select some processes to be suspended or swapped out, right? So when you when you swap out a process, you select it, you deallocate all of its memory that was currently assigned or allocated to it, thus freeing up some memory um, for maybe other processes to use, right? So the process is still in the system, but it doesn't have any RAM assigned to it if it's been suspended or swapped out, right? So that, that's the basic idea of swapping out a process. And later on, once once things free up a bit, we might select a process to reactivate it, to, to swap it back in. Yeah. Um, oops. So uh, anyway, that, that's what the first question is about. So if, if you understand, um, this is asking about um, um, if we made a dispatcher, you know, why, you know, what if we um, considered not only just processes that were ready, but also processes that were ready, but uh, suspended. So ready, but swapped out, right? So, so you have to think about that. So norm, no, normally most dispatchers, uh, when it wants to select the next running, next process to become the running process, it's only going to look at the ready processes. But in theory, something that's ready but swapped out, if I just swapped it back in, it, it would be immediately ready to run, right? So, um, so that first question is kind of about the trade-off between those two things, right? Um, The um, and then the second question is about um, uh, this bit of code here. So it's, it's about threads. So chapter four is about threading. This is an example of, of act, an actual um, threaded application that's using the pthread library on Linux, uh, which is uh, you probably get it on Windows too, but it's uh, the POSIX defined uh, threading library here. So um, real quickly, you know. Uh, uh, make certain you kind of understand the basics of what's going on here, and, and then you have to answer some questions about this code. So the, the basics of what's happening here is that, um, you know, when you run a program normally, 
um, on an operating system, it, it'll, it'll start with a single thread. So if you have a multi-threaded operating system uh, and you run um, a program, run an executable, um, it, it, it initially starts the program with one thread and that thread, like in a C program, will start executing the code in the main function, right? So we'll start by executing these lines. Uh, now this, this pthread library, whenever you call pthread create, this creates another thread, right? And, and starts that thread running. So the result of calling pthread create is that a second thread um, is run within the context of my program. Uh, the first thread is going to continue running the code in main, right? So, so after this, this function call returns, the first thread, um, if, it, if it's successful, will, you know, you know, this if only happens if there's an error. So if it's successful, I'll jump over and it'll start doing this for loop here. But the second thread will start running the code in the function that's declared in this first parameter here, right? So you'll notice that, um, um, I'm sorry, in the third parameter here. So this is actually the name of the function to run in the thread that we just create, right? So the, the second thread that starts running um, after pthread create does its work, uh, will start in this function and start running in this loop, okay? So that's the basics of what's happening here, all right? Um, and uh, as a final thing here, I wanna mention that um, There is another, this, this will be useful for this starting this week. There's another repository. If you look under the additional resources uh, with code examples, um, um, this link here, the um, uh, CS430 example repository. So I can just go ahead and open this up here. Um, So this has some sub projects. So this has um, uh, some examples for doing the standard template library, which you know I'll try and talk about that on Wednesday if people need some help with that. But you can look in here for um, the the code in the video that I have about the standard template library, uh, which you'll need for the second assignment. But it also has some code for the second problem set here uh, for this question uh, two that I was just talking about here. So you can clone this. This is meant to be cloned using HTTPS, so read only, right? So, so you can't push code back into this example, but you can clone this repository um, into um, BS code. Let me go ahead and um, close this folder and, and, and go ahead and clone that here. And we um, stop that dev container. Uh, I might have already clone this, but, but, you know, as you were doing for the assignments, if you open up your source code control tab uh, sidebar and do clone repository and paste the HTTP URL. Um, and um, I, probably, I probably already did this, but um, let me see. Eh, maybe not. So, um, and then, you know, um, um, have it clone, have it downloaded to somewhere on your local file system to get a local copy of the repository. Um, uh, you don't really want to open this in, in the, uh, the at, at the base, uh, like you do for your assignments normally. normally. Let me, let me cancel that. Let me kind of show you why real quickly. So when I just cloned that, um, I should have ended up with a directory called CSCI430. Uh, that OS Sims. Um, and um, uh, sorry, CSCI430 example. Um, and it's really these subfolders that are the, the projects, right? So you need to open up, um, like, uh, let's go ahead and open up PS02. So what you really want to do after you clone the repository, if I want to run the example for this, uh, the, the second question for the problem set, I, I want to open up that folder after I've um, cloned the repository down to my local system. So I'll go ahead and do a um, uh, open folder, uh, open up that repos, um, CSA 430 um, example. It's weird. 
I'm having trouble finding those. Um, Be a little bug in VS Code. I don't know why it's not showing up on my file browser here. Um, anyway, I've got another. This is essentially the same thing, but for um, my graduate class. Um, but anyway, you want to check to select the 530 example, but you want to select the uh, a particular folder in there if you want to run any of these code examples, um, like problem set zero two. Uh, you do that because, again, the, the problem set 02 folder uh, is kind of what you should be familiar with now, like for the assignments, including it has, uh, it's set up to run in a Linux dev container. So I'll reopen it in a container. And um, basically the... Um, The uh, file called uh, problem set two race um, is the same code for the problem set question, or, or should be about the same. Once the dev container starts up here, um, there we go. So you know, uh, you know, I encourage you, you know, uh, if you want to get more insight into this question, you know, not to. Not not only just to um, uh, read the question, but you know, actually compile and try running the code. Uh, yeah, the code in in uh, hopefully the one that I gave you guys will be the same. Uh, but yeah, I think that um, um, it runs for just twenty five on each of these loops here. I had it slightly different in here. Um, oh, but yeah, the another thing is uh, your keyboard shortcuts might not work um, uh, in here. Let me try them out. And so uh, they may or may not work for you. Uh, yeah, so I just did a control uh, C to do a clean and control uh, B to do a build. Uh, if it's working, it should build everything. If it's not working, you might have to open up a terminal and build it by hand. You know, So um, I can do uh, open up a terminal and always do a make clean. Uh, make should build everything, including uh, uh, this one here. There's some other things in there, but uh, for this problem set question, I think it's this one called problem set to race. Right? And what this does is this, uh, if, if you build it su successfully, um, it creates an executable um, called PS02. Right? So if you want to try running it, dot slash PS02 to, to run that one. Right? Uh, so it should do that. Um, um, so in the code I gave you, it should be just doing a regular sleep instead of trying to do a micro sleep. So yeah, you should see something kind of like that. Um, you'll get some O's and dots and it'll um, take a little bit of time to run those things. But this might help get you some insight on the uh, second problem set question. Um, if you compile it and run it by hand here. Um, and, and see what it's doing there. So kind of a hint, uh, yeah, it is already 12 here, but kind of a hint, you know, so uh, a lot of students that do this question uh, seem to assume that you should get perfect interleaving, right? So you should see O dot, O dot, O dot, O dot, but that is not true. Um, and if you run this by hand, you should see often is the case that you'll get two or maybe sometimes three or four of one or the other run in a row before it switches back to the other one. Um, and yeah, I guess as a final hint, you know, so the really the big question is um, it output. So if you look at the end of the main function, um, after main does its loop, it does another call to pthread. Uh, the join basically causes uh, this thread to pause here until all the other threads finish, right? So then after all the other threads finish, uh, it will continue on, and this is where you're getting the output here, right? So one of the main questions is, you know, um, if you get a result of, we got a result of 49, 
for this value here, you know, is that what you would expect? What kind of should you expect there? And what's going on that you don't, what you would expect? Um, all right, good. Uh, any last uh, things anybody wants to raise before I kind of wrap it up here? So that should all be um, um, some good things for everybody to look at and work on. I hope those are all helpful. Um, all right, so that's it for the session. I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, wrap it up. Uh, I'll, I'll get this posted as quick as I can. Uh, as usual, you know, email me if you have questions. Feel free to. Uh, I've actually finally got a GA for this class. I'll post their information as well. So if you're more comfortable uh, talking with a, a student, um, uh, feel free to contact them as well about the problem set or program assignments. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. So let's go ahead and stop. Um, um, our session for today then.